In a lot of ways, we've gained efficiencies with technology and with great processes, but the workplace is asking us to kind of separate the personal from the professional still, when really we're all bringing our whole selves wherever we are. We're not disassociating from our personal lives. And that I think that really got brought up very expansively within the pandemic. You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. My guest today is Sally Loftus. She is the daughter of teachers, innovators, and visionaries who taught her from a young age to deeply listen to everybody in her circle of influence. She started with activism in high school. She volunteered and worked in spaces so that all people can feel seen, heard, and represented in her work. While owning her own business takes time, she is just as passionate about her family and her community. She's married with three kids. She has a dog. She lives in Newland, North Carolina. She also serves as a regional member of the Equality North Carolina PAC and board member for Charlie's Heart Foundation and North Carolina Child. Welcome to the podcast, Sally. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. I'm excited to speak with you. Let's start with the first question I ask everyone. What does woman of value mean to you? Thank you. I appreciate this question uh, because I think there's times in my life where maybe I didn't quite have a clear answer. But I think at this point, my answer is that we are inherently valuable um, from the beginning. And sometimes it just takes time to understand that. I think our value comes in that we're connected to nature, you know, um, and that, you know, how we live in the, on this earth, but also value because, um, we're human and we bring a specific contribution to the earth. Our humanity, our nature connection, and just, just being us, like mm-hmm. <laughs> being born, you don't have to prove anything, right? Take us to the, moment or moments when you began to really appreciate your own value as a woman? Absolutely. And I will say, you know, it's definitely starts and stops right now. I'm in my mid forties. So there's, there's several moments I think I could share. One that I think has been pretty pivotal in my forties has been, I went back to get my graduate school degree in my forties. And that was as a result of hitting this point in my life that I realized that I really needed to kind of shift directions. That was really, my marriage was in a bad place at the time. My kids were um, kind of getting older and realizing that I had a little more space in my life to maybe add more. And then realizing that I really didn't have any places that really were just about me and my growth. They were all about other people's growth and helping them. And so I decided to kind of make this shift to go back and get a little more education and um, kind of deepen my career in a different way. And that process really helped me learn how to kind of prioritize myself and my own needs um, in a way that I don't know that I would have found otherwise. So many of us when we're raising families, we forget about ourselves, right? We're the last on our to-do list, as Oprah used to say. And I think it's great that you did that so young in your mid forties, in your forties, you're in your mid forties now, but you, so you got Mm -hmm. your degree when you were in your early forties. Yes. I just graduated about three years ago. And thank you for saying forties is young. My teenagers (laughs) would not agree with you. So thank you. (laughs) Well, you know, it's all relative. It's all relative. And uh, I mean, I'm in my 60s, so 40 sounds really young to me now because I remember when I was in my 40s and my kids were starting to get older and that's when I decided to get divorced and change careers and pivot my entire life. So I think in, in midlife, as we call it, a lot of people have these wake up moments where they discover that they have had some things that they have not been addressing, whether it's self-care or really realizing a dream or a goal. And it's your time, you know, and especially as kids get older and if you have a family. So how, how old are your kids now? Now they are 23, um, 17 and 15. Okay. So you're still in the throes of teenage 
bliss. I, 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 yes, I have one graduating <laughs> this year from high school um, and then one that just started high school and then one um, on his own as far as you can be at 23 in this time of life, you know, kind of post pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Not an easy time to be growing up and trying to find work and all the stuff that, that make us adults. So you went back to school and what did you study? Yeah, I went back and got my master's of science and organization development. And that was really, my bachelor's had been in human resources and I had worked in human resources in kind of various you know, avenues within what I would call the employee life cycle. But I decided I really wanted to kind of dig into the research aspect Um, that had always interested me, but I had never, you know, kind of dug further into it. And I think I always thought I would get an MBA, but every time I kept looking at MBA programs, I just kept being like, this is not what I want. And actually, um, my husband suggested, he was like, you always talk about organizational behavior. Like, have you looked at any programs about that? I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, And so I started looking into programs and that's how I kind of ended up with the MSOD. So tell us a little bit about what that means. Like what is Mm -hmm. organizational behavior, organizational science for anybody who doesn't know? Yeah. Absolutely. It's one of those things that typically kind of runs in the background of business, right? Um, You know, a business is designed in a certain way. Typically, there's a strategy, there are people, processes, kind of workflows, um, the way people are paid, the culture, things like that. That's all around organizational design and organizational development, which it's all very closely tied together, um, is really about helping people manage the nature of change within organizations. And it's a really interesting time to be in that because the nature of change has sped up quite a bit with the pandemic and um, things just aren't as constant anymore, except for change, right? So there's a lot more need around that kind of intentional process of change. Change is always constant. I think that's the one thing if we're going to prepare our children for real life, prepare them how to deal with crisis, with change, with things that don't go their way, because when things go smoothly, it's a lot easier to manage. That is so true. I I think about now, I feel sorry for like kids. Of course, I have, you know, kids this age, but of trying to choose a major in college, because I think, goodness, you know, I've been on college 25 years, even then, I think there were possibilities to have multiple careers. But now, I mean, you think about kids, I mean, you could have five or six different, very full 10 to 15 year careers at this point. And so it's, I, I appreciate that. I love that you can have so many different things because I think some of us, so many of us are multi-talented, but yeah, it can be kind of unnerving when you feel like you're having to keep you know, start over or kind of transition to something maybe you don't know as much about, that can certainly tap into your insecurities. Definitely. And a lot of people just stay with what they know because it feels safe and it feels known, even though it's not working. So is there any advice you would give somebody who's considering change, but is kind of stuck in that place of fear? That's a great question because I think it's so common, right? We all have fear and there's different levels of fear. It could be individual fear. It could be financial fear, relationship fear. I mean, there's just so many elements of it. I think my piece of advice is always to be in community with people, right? Is to always lean into those friendships, family, community, you know, neighbors, whomever, your tribe, whoever that might be to really lean in there because there's so many times where we may not believe in ourselves or may not, you know, be able to see kind of what the future can hold. And those are the people who can kind of speak into our lives, right? And say, absolutely, I see you doing that, or, you know, that's a great idea or whatever. So I think community is super important at every single age in life. Really true. I unfortunately had a lot of people who said, you're crazy to start a new career at this stage in life. And why don't you do what's safe? Like go work at Starbucks because they have medical insurance. (laughs) You know, I had a lot of people were like life coaching. What the heck are you doing? (laughs) So I think you have to find your right community and Mm -hmm. people who really believe in you and who are there to support you, even if they don't fully understand what you're doing, because 
a lot of careers are not so cut and dry and understandable. And there will be years where you're struggling and yeah. where you're not making the income that you want to be making. And that's part of the process. And I think a lot of people quit before they actually start to get some traction. Is that something that you've seen in your work? Absolutely. Yeah. I started my own consulting business in the pandemic, which I had planned on opening my business in February, 2020, and was kind of looking around thinking, hmm, you know, things aren't going so well out here. Um, and then my kids came home in March and were here, you know, around for a while. So that completely kind of upended things. But um, my husband and I had already kind of planned on me at least not making money for a year. And I realized that's a privilege to have that. But we had kind of been like, okay, if if I'm going to start my own consulting firm, like I really need to be able to kind of have some time to develop it and things like that. And so it's definitely been a growing process. I mean, I think I've heard that like some small businesses take three to five years to turn a profit. So I think whenever you're starting something, it can, you know, it's a big financial risk. But what I tell a lot of people who, for instance, are interested in getting into consulting, I tell them, you know, try some side gigs, like gig work is so popular right now. So, you know, connect with some friends or people, you know, that do this and do some side gigs and see if you see if you really like it. And then you can kind of build some income on the side before you make the big jump. That's really good advice. I totally agree. Because what happens is if you have so much fear about income that you start to get freaked out about not making the, enough money, you're actually not going to continue doing the work that you love because the money is going to get in the way. And so I know for myself, I had like five businesses going when I started my coaching practice because I couldn't make enough right away. You have to build clientele you have to get marketing. You have to get out there get your name known. And um, I had a lot of skills that I, that were marketable that it was already doing before I became a coach. And so I chose to do things that I already was doing that would earn me more per hour than like working at Starbucks, for example. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was painting furniture and getting paid for doing artwork. Um, I had a bunch of little things like that. And I was a teacher. Um, so yeah, I think if you can find those side gigs, it takes the pressure off of making your business have to earn enough to pay the mortgage or whatever it is that you're paying at the time. Absolutely. And I think what what's easy to fall into in talking about fear and what, you know, how you value yourself is that if you're so, if you're putting everything onto, for instance, starting this business, you may be willing to charge less than your worth mm -hmm. because you're just desperate for it. Right. And I was really encouraged, you know, after a couple of years in my consulting firm of clients being like, you're not charging enough. And which is unusual for clients to say, I might say, <laughs> but they were like compared to kind of the level of work we're getting from you and other consultants we work with. Like, I don't think, you know, they were like, we don't think you value your, you know, services and experience enough. You need to really think about that. And that was super helpful for me because, you know, I was kind of new into it and to again, kind of have that community of people speaking that into my life was so crucial for me. Yeah, it's hard to know how to charge and what other people are charging and how do you decide what to charge for your services. And definitely when you start out, you're not charging your full worth because mm -hmm. you're still building experience and you don't you don't have enough experience yet to feel you can charge the big, big prices. But that's really amazing that your clients told you that. It's usually the opposite. They're like, can we bargain you down and get you to... <laughs> charge us less money. Um, I know that when I started, I think I was charging like 50 a session or something. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it was that maybe it was like the price of a movie. I, you know, it was just like, I had no experience. So how do you charge mm -hmm. somebody? And I had terrible boundaries. I couldn't end a session on time. Like I, it was a lot of learning that goes into this whole thing. And now my fees are much, much, much higher than that. So it's, you know, and it's not for everybody. There are different consultants and coaches for people who want different things. And that's why we have variety out there. But I want to circle back to something in your bio, actually, mm -hmm. and um, talk a little bit about how you were raised, because I think mm -hmm. that was just so interesting to me 
that your parents were inspirational and they raised mm-hmm. you to be a visionary. So t- tell us a little bit more about what that looked like. Yeah. Sometimes I get asked about my bio and say, why do you start with the daughter of? And it's really about reminding myself that I come from a lineage of incredibly strong people that have such rich stories in different ways. And I was actually brought up, um, I lived with my parents, but lived right next door to my mother's parents, my uh, maternal grandparents. And so they really were my primary caregivers. And at the time, you know, they were retired because retirement age was 55 back then. And they were retired and basically spent their time serving people in the community. So I grew up going to nursing homes, to, you know, taking meals, to shut-ins, to, I mean, just kind of all of that uh, work and really feeling comfortable and just that being normalized for me, um, they very often served in the margins of the community. And so that really made an impact on me, especially as obviously I got older and experienced what other people's families were or were not doing, or even like, I think as an adult, like I have no issue walking right into a nursing home and having a conversation with somebody. I didn't realize that was not common until... (laughs) Until I got to be an adult would, you know, maybe go with a group in there and people be like, I've never been in here. And I'm like, oh, you know, I grew up doing this. So I really appreciate that legacy of service that my grandparents gave me. And especially in kind of what were probably the best, you know, some of the best years of their life. I think about, I didn't even know, get to know them until they were 55. That had to be a great version of themselves. You know, I think at four, I'm much better at 40 something than, you know, 20 something. And so that was really impactful for me. It's lovely that you not only learn from them, but you appreciate and acknowledge them because I don't see that very often. Mm. And being of service is, is so important. There are so few people who really understand how important it is because it also brings humility. It helps us have more perspective in life. It helps us to appreciate what we do have, what we don't have. You know, I think there's so much that comes from being of service. And that's why also the service professions, really, when you're making a contribution to other people, it is so valuable. Which brings me to my next question, which is you talk about bringing humanity to the workplace. So can you define what that is to you? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, You know, having worked in human resources for the last 20 plus years, one thing I've noticed is that in a lot of ways, we've gained efficiencies with technology and with great processes, you know, kind of across businesses, things like that. But uh, still, I feel like the workplace is asking us to kind of separate the personal from the professional still, Um, when really we're all bringing our whole selves wherever we are. You know, we're not disassociating um, from, you know, kind of our personal lives. And that I think that really um, got brought up very expansively within the pandemic, right? You're in people, you know, when people went to those who are able to do remote work, you went into people's homes and you started seeing where they live or, you know seeing people they take care of or pets or, you know, kind of more, we knew each other on a more intimate level. And I think that brought out the need for more humanity in the workplace and more policies and practices that really support who we are as humans, rather than looking at people as numbers or assets to be managed. What we do in one place, we often do in other places in our lives. And I think the more we can recognize that people are humans, and if they're working for somebody, that there are human needs. If you have ever played small to make other people feel comfortable, or maybe stayed in a bad relationship or job too long because you didn't think you could do any better, I wrote a book for you. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. Each of the 30 chapters contains a life lesson, a story, and an exercise to bring you closer to reaching your full potential. Becoming a Woman of Value is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. My daughter is working for a big corporation. And when she started, it was the pandemic and she and everybody was remote. And finally, back in this January, they started back to office two days a week. That's it. So by this time, she had moved to Los Angeles and we live in Connecticut. And mm-hmm. um, she said, well, you know, if I'm working remotely, I'm, I'm going to go someplace 
that I've always wanted to go. And she ended up falling in love with LA, loved working remotely and was really upset about having to come back. So she still has an apartment in LA and she's mm-hmm. living in Connecticut now. So she's kind of traveling back and forth and it's crazy. And she spoke to HR, I think it was this morning. Mm-hmm. And she said, can you help me figure this out? Cause I want to stay in the company but I really love being in LA and I like working remotely. How can we, how can we make this work? And they were like, not even hearing her. And she said, if they could have just been empathic, if they could have even just thought about how maybe we can promote you into a role where you can be more remote, you know, they just didn't really work with her. And that was, that was really a shame because the next step, if she can't really figure it out, is going to be she's going to have to leave the company and she's mm-hmm. one of the top performers. And so these are important conversations and it's important for HR to recognize that you have to make your employees happy and try to make it work, right? Yeah, definitely. And I hate that for your daughter. Um because it really, it's honestly a story I hear a lot from people is that, you know, they made big life changes in the pandemic. We really didn't know how long it was. It went on, I think, a lot longer than most people thought it was going to. And then they figured out this flow of kind of life and work. And then organizations have brought people back. And I totally understand why they've done that. But I'm, um, I think whenever we have a one size fits all approach for human resources, we really lose out on talent because that's just really not who we are. Again, who we are as humans, not all, we're not all the same. We all have differences. And a lot of times I see companies push back on that because they're like, well, we don't have time, you know, to think through that. But kind of to your point, you were saying if they could have just listened with some empathy and really thought through the situation, um, you know, that might be a way to retain an employee in an environment that is really hard to keep yeah. employees right now. So why, you know, why wouldn't you think through if we have this policy, you know, for some people to, you know, be remote, or fully remote or whatever, and still work together? You know, I, I, I see a lot of organizations that are not prioritizing flexibility right now, especially in the human resources area. Yeah, I think a lot of times like decisions are made, especially for corporations, decisions are made at the top and they're not even aware of what's going on on the ground. And I've seen this because I've never worked for a corporation. I've been self-employed most of my life, Mm -hmm. but I've seen it with a couple of my kids where the ideas sound good. You know, my son worked for a company, a very big company, and they believed everybody should do the same jobs. So, but they didn't get paid equally. <laughs> so, mm. um, you know, now you're, you're a consultant and you're mm-hmm. a salesperson and you're an expert in this and that. And, and then you're expected to just pivot. And then the pandemic happens and there were mental health issues going on throughout the company where everybody was mm-hmm. burning out mm-hmm. and the, the model wasn't working and nobody was paying attention. They had managers who were really not managerial. They had people who just couldn't be trusted. And, you know, he could see the organizational issues, but the organization itself was failing. And this mm-hmm. is a humongous company. I mean, it's a company with, with a lot of people and a huge reputation and does really well in the stock market, but people are not paying attention. So tell us about your business. Let's take us to the present. You started during the pandemic. Tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit more about what you do and what, what services you provide. Yeah, definitely. And I want to say good for your son. That's a great, great Intel. I agree. There are a lot of times um, frontline or, you know, um, entry level people have a better eye on the organization than leaders do. And that's kind of leads into some of my work is that I work, you know, kind of in the human resources space in that I work, I've always worked more on the strategy side of human resources. So again, kind of that design, thinking through kind of how do we structure our organization, the, you know, the people we need, the jobs we need, how we do that workflow. I also work a lot in the pay equity space. Of course, I was paying attention to what you were saying there. And um, helping organizations really think through how how to implement pay equity um, as a systemic intervention. And then I also do a lot of facilitation and coaching and training kind of on the side um, for some organizations. And I have my own 
um, kind of products as well. So it's it's a vast variety, even though human resources is much bigger than that. It sounds like you have your hands full. <laughs> You're providing a lot of really good services. And I, it's, it's fascinating to me because I, I love human design. I love mm -hmm. organization. I love systems. And I find that so few people that I interact with have systems. Mm -hmm. they, they'll say, can you hop on a Zoom call next week? What works for you? That's like 20 conversations that we have to exchange emails instead of take a look at this link and right. pick a date that works for you. Like how few people have scheduling services mm -hmm. or even in my podcast, you know, I have a whole system with forms and ways that people right. can can join the podcast. And I, I've been on many podcasts as well. And I see so few of them. They're like, pick a date. Oh, there's like no calendar invitation. <laughs> there's no nothing. And, and then people forget. My clients actually have said to me, I really like the way you run your business. And I do it because I like to have that interface as a client. And so I want my clients to have the best, easiest, seamless, experience when they work with me. So I totally respect what you do. And, um, and I understand the need for a lot of what you're talking about. Well, and I will say, you know, thinking about the process we went through to get, you know, here of like how you made it easy for me, but you also made it easy for yourself. And right. so even thinking about like, you know, kind of working with organizations, how often I will ask organizations. So tell me kind of what your employee feedback situation is and they'll be like we don't really ask our employees for feedback <laughs> okay or they might say we have an annual survey or something like that and really working with organizations to kind of provide multiple ways for people to give feedback there's so, like you said there's so many great tools right now a lot of them free I work with a lot of nonprofits um, you know just that just kind of take some intention and design and kind of calibration you know among the group that can really give some robust uh, performance feedback, whatever it is for organizations in a fairly simple way. A lot of times it's those frontline or, you know, kind of entry-level people that probably know what needs to happen way better than anybody in the senior leadership team do. It's so true. I, I remember working for companies and coming in and seeing, you can, when you first start, you can see where all the holes are. You can see what's working well. You can see what feels right. You can see where the communication is off, but people aren't really asking. They're not open. Mm -hmm. My son ended up quitting, by the way. He couldn't handle it anymore. And uh, he's so happy he did. He he got to a point where he was just coming, coming home and like lying on the floor because mm -hmm. he was so burnt out. And he took care of himself, which most of his friends did not. They stayed in the company and complained. And it would really do companies well if they spoke to people more often. I mean, you know, just having the courage to ask people for feedback is is so critical. Sally, what does the future hold for you? Oh goodness, the future is so much, right? And we have no idea what it's gonna look like. You know, we are coming out of a, you know, pandemic and whatever, whatever the world holds for us, right? I will say for me, I just kind of, there's different levels of it. I'm getting to a point where like my kids are going to be graduating high school, knock on wood, uh, you know, kind of this different point in life. So that's, that's kind of interesting to think about, like what my life looks like in the next, you know, kind of five to six years. Um, and I think professionally for me, um, kind of in three years, I've been able to work with over 50 clients, which has been amazing. And thinking about what does that look like for me as, you know, kind of personally as a small business owner, especially a female small business owner, uh, what does growth look like? And, you know, where do I go with that? And what does that, how does that work in the way that I want to work and it be meaningful? And then I think kind of the other piece is, you know, speaking to the human resources piece is I'm excited about the organizations and the conversations that are happening about humanity, you know, in the workplace and thinking about how can we slow down, have some conversations, especially about pay, which a lot is happening. The younger generations are really bringing that forward and really thinking about, you know, what are people's worth at work? And I think it's a lot more than probably what most people get paid. Um, I can 
probably give you research on that. But, um, you know, I think just be, people being able to be transparent about pay and kind of what their work experience is like. And again, not having to kind of divide yourself between personal and professional, like being able to show up who you are, wherever you are. I so agree with that. I, I, I work with some business clients as well as my dating coaching clients and relationship clients. And in business, I, I have one client who I've worked with for many years, who's a decorator, interior designer. And she really never talks to other designers. As one mm. thing I, I've told her so many times, find your community of people, talk to them about the systems they use, the pay they get, what they provide, how they do all what they do, because you, you're working in a vacuum and many people undercharge, you know, she, I think she still is, she's on the cusp. Um, I think she, she charges almost her worth, but she often feels bad about Mm -hmm. certain charges and it takes a lot to own your worth. And the other day, somebody challenged me on my prices and he said, wow, I, I just paid for you for a month. And Mm -hmm. that comes to this amount per hour. That's a lot of money. And I said, that's my fee. Mm -hmm. Like the old me would have been like, no, maybe I'm charging you too much. And I should, (laughs) nope. I just, I'm not apologetic. If you don't find value in it, there are other people who will, and that's fine. Absolutely fine. Absolutely. Yeah. And it takes a while to get there, right. And to get to that point. And you also start realizing that people who are kind of asking you those kinds of questions, you have enough of those conversations to know, like maybe I wouldn't want them as a client anyways. Um, And, or like I provide typically like I work with businesses across the board. So I typically will provide a discount to smaller nonprofits, right. Um, just cause I know they have less resources. I want to be able to help them, you know, so there's ways to kind of do sliding scales and things like that, that I've tried to tap into a mm-hmm. little bit. Yeah. This is actually somebody who hired me for six months. He paid me my worth and then he came back to get some more support. And then he started questioning my fees. And I said, you know, you've been paying this for six months. And he said, Oh, wow. I didn't even realize I was paying that. I, I think he was just in a bad mood, but nice. <laughs> we'll see if he, <laughs> wow. but it, you know, it gives you pause though. You start to think, well, is that too much? But mm-hmm. I know people who charge more, so it's not too much. It's when you really value the person you're working with, you are willing to pay and mm-hmm. you see the transformation. You see what happens when you apply what that person is guiding you towards. And, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine who has been through years and years of therapy, years and years and years, and she's dealing with some really heavy stuff. And I've had conversations with her based on my own coaching Mm -hmm. that have opened her eyes to seeing herself in a way that no therapist has ever done. And she said, you know, I think I want to hire you. And this is a good friend of mine. So it's like, yeah. that's always a little dicey, but yeah. But I was opening her eyes to something she never even knew existed and that would help her tremendously. And so people come in at all levels of expertise and you find what works for you and you're willing to pay, even if it's a friend, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you have to have good boundaries. But um, yeah, anyway, so let's let's get to the lightning round. Are you ready? I am. I'm super excited about this. (laughs) Okay. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. Skinny enough. Oh, (laughs) I haven't heard that one. Um, There's a lot of like good enough and pretty enough. How did you work through the skinny enough issue? I will say I'm still working through it, but doing a lot of work around body image and realizing kind of the systems in our society that are built around certain body sizes and, you know, things about women, right? Um, Certain images of women and um, really trying to kind of build a new narrative um, inside myself about what, um, what body image, healthy body image is. Yeah, that's good. I've done a lot of interviews with people who specialize in body positivity and body image and reframing how we see ourselves because, 
it's not about being skinny. It's about being healthy. It's about having a healthy approach to our bodies, which is really hard to do in Mm -hmm. the world of Instagram and every, oh my God, the compare and despair. (sighs) All right. Next question. (laughs) What was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value? Understanding how to change what I call the tapes in my head of the messages that I had kind of taken in, in my socialization and growing up um, and being able to create new tapes. Which is very much like the whole skinny thing. Mm -hmm. It's all about the tapes. It's reframing and changing those messages because they're just stuff that somebody else put there. Now you get to put the ones you like better. (laughs) Absolutely. Next question. What is the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? I would recommend being in community with women that you admire and bring out the best in you. Because sometimes we can be in community with people whose lives we don't want to emulate, right? And so it's thinking about who who you surround yourself with matters. It really does. What advice would you give to your younger self? This is such a tough question, but I will say uh, you are absolutely perfect. A masterpiece, really, just the way you are at every stage of life. That's beautiful. Yeah, we really struggle with that one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Striving to be something we're not is such a big part of life. It's like, I would, I'll, I'll be okay if I get that master's degree and then I'll have to get the mm-hmm. PhD and then my right. business will get to this level. And then I'm going to have to get to that next level. And, and when do you stop? Right. So just to appreciate who you are at every mm-hmm. stage, because there is beauty and perfection and masterpiece at every stage. Mm, definitely. What is something that people often get wrong about you? This is probably an answer. I feel like you've gotten a lot on your show, but that I have it all together all the time and never feel insecure. So do you show the more vulnerable side of yourself? I try to. Absolutely. That is one thing when I went back for my master's program, I had so many great kind of feedback opportunities in that. And some of the best advice I got was lean into your vulnerability. So I try to think about how to do that. A couple of examples are um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and write a lot with blogs. And so I try to kind of share stories about myself. For instance, like uh, International Women's Day was recently, I shared a post about um, how I was brought up to compete with other women and kind of just shared about like how I've, you know, kind of how that impacted me and how much I appreciate having women in my life now. Um, And then also try to, with my clients, always try to build a personal relationship before we ever get into a conversation. Um, I'm typically connecting with them on a personal level of, you know, prioritizing connection over content. You connected with me on LinkedIn before yeah. we met. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I did. You are a connector. Yeah. And finally, Sally, how would you like to be remembered? That I brought more kindness into the world. I love that. We can all bring a little more kindness We'd all be better off. Um, Share one link that Mm -hmm. you would like people to go to, and I'll put the rest of them in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, You can find me on LinkedIn where I post throughout the week, but I'll just say that um, you can connect to me and my consulting firm on our website, which is www.loftispartners, and that's L-O-F-T-I-S, partners.com. And I also have a podcast special for your listeners Mm. um, that I'll include in the links is that I'm offering a free hour of coaching to your listeners and they can book a time with me by going to my website, loftuspartners.com forward slash podcast dot special. It can be personal. It can be about your organization, whatever it is, but I'm happy to offer um, listeners a free hour just to kind of talk through such a nice offer. Well, thank you so much, Sally. This has just been an inspirational conversation and I appreciate your value that you bring to others and to yourself. And I, I love that you recognize that you needed to pay more attention to you. And I hope that inspires other people to take a stand for what really matters. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for what you're bringing into the world and all the amazing stories of women um, throughout this country, you know, in the greater globe. There's just so many we could spend the rest of our lives just listening to stories. I love the stories and I appreciate yours. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please follow, rate, review, subscribe, do all the good things so that we can keep making these great episodes and be a woman of value. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.